Hey, it's summertime. Time to slap on some sunscreen, pull up a chair at the beach, and ride the waves with the sales pipeline and Matt Hines. Hey, Matt. How are we doing, Paul? I'm good. I'm good. You ready to uh, ride the surf and uh, and show us some tricks today here? I, I am ready to ride the surf, although um, I am coming off of Shark Week. Uh, you know, <laughs> because of the Olympics this year, or the Shark Week got moved from August to July, and so uh-huh. in our house... Uh, my wife and our three kids, they are, uh, they are obsessed with sharks. And so, um, you know, and, and with the beauty of the DVRs we have these days, it's not shark week. It's apparently shark month because we just recorded, oh, wow. we record, our, 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 our hard drive is full of these shark shows. And so like every night we're watching. Love it. Shark shows. And so when I think of like surf, now all I think of are these interviews with surfers that have like chunks of their side cut out. And these boards that cut out. <laughs> exactly. It's, um, do you watch have to a, change the analogy? I don't know. Do you watch a Sharknado? Isn't that, isn't that what it's called? I have not. I have not seen Sharknado. Oh. No, that's a totally different genre. <laughs> it's just a uh, sort of ridiculous uh, you know, sci-fi theater. Uh, very different. Um, yeah, but we're not here to talk about Shark Week. No. Like a, probably, I, I, I could go on for 25 minutes. <laughs> I'd love to. Few days, I mean, the, the Mako shark and these like all the, the migratory habits. It's very fun. But uh, no, we're here for Sales Pipeline Radio. Thanks again for joining us, everybody. Excited to have another week uh, of Sales Pipeline Radio. Thanks to everyone for joining us live. Uh, we uh, continue to see just a really uh, impressive uh, volume of people joining us in the live call, joining us on the podcast as well. Uh, for those of you who are listening after uh, to our on-demand version from salespipelineradio.com as well as through uh, Google Play and the iTunes Store. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, we today are going to feature part two of our two-part series on preparing for the second half of the year. Uh, you know, we last week uh, we 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 uh, had our show on the last day of the month, the last day of the quarter. So I'm assuming we had zero salespeople listening. Uh, hopefully, they were listening uh, to the on-demand version the next day. Once maybe they, they were the successful salespeople who had already met their goals. You know? Maybe, maybe if they hit their goal, why not close another deal and just you know hit the accelerator on your commission plan, right? But uh, no, we. Um, I mean, here we are now. You know, day seven of the new month, the new quarter, and even especially if you're working on a monthly basis, you're almost 25 percent of the way through the month. So how you doing? It's, it's already time to start looking at, okay, like, are you hitting your number? You may not have deals closed. If you work on a quarterly basis, you may not have all your deals closed. Uh, if you're working on a quarterly basis, monthly basis, but you can still start to evaluate how well are you building up that pipeline? How well are you qualifying deals? How well are you driving urgency? Uh, for deals. Uh, so we've got a lot of great content to share today. We're going to talk about uh, a number of additional things you can do if you're already behind on your sales pipeline. We'll walk through some additional things that you can do immediately if you're behind on your sales pipeline goals. It includes marketing tactics. And Paul, like we did last week, I think let's invite people if they want to call in um, and ask their questions about pipeline building uh, for the new month, new quarter. Let's give them the, the phone number for that. Absolutely. Two ways to do it. Uh, they can call up if they're brave enough and ask you on air. Uh, the number Number is 949-330-7760. That's our studio here in Southern California. 949-330-77. I'm sorry, 7761. Let's get that right. Make sure they call the studio line. 949-330-7761. We'll put you on the air. 949-330-7761. Or they can tweet us at OC Talk Radio. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, we've uh, we had some guests last week. Excited to have that. Uh, we are going to next week get back in the habit, back in the rhythm of featuring some amazing speakers, some amazing uh, some authors, uh, and we'll walk through some of that after we get past the break. But do want to? Uh, yeah, Paul, go ahead. I had one question that came yeah. to me after uh, we ended last week's show, and I was thinking about this all along because I knew this was going to be the second half. How important is it psychologically? to get off to a good start and close a deal in the first week of the month or first week of the quarter. Does that sort of set the tone or or is that not matter? Well, I mean, it, it certainly uh, is an advantage. I mean, the earlier you can put something on the board, uh, the less pressure it takes off of you towards the end of the month and end of the quarter. Um, so I think it certainly is an advantage. I, I think you can set yourself up for failure if you expect that and don't have the pipeline for it. Um, it I mean, you you know your business. You know the sales cycle you go through. You should at least. And you know the rhythms that those customers are going to go through. So if you're sitting here on the seventh day of the month and you're selling on a monthly sales cycle, maybe you've got some deals Close good for you. Maybe your deals are going to mostly close second half of the month. But what can you do at the beginning of that cycle to feel successful, to be successful? So a couple ways I'd approach that. One, I mean, if you're in sales, you know that you know sales is a very emotional 
job. You know that sales um, is, is a difficult job. It is an emotional job, and it is a mental – the mental game of sales, which we talked quite a bit about last week, is extremely important. Your ability not only to focus on what matters, uh, but be disciplined with your time. Be disciplined about where you're putting your focus on your target accounts. Um, oftentimes, you get to the end of the month, end of the quarter, you have flushed out your short-term you know, closable pipeline you know, to hit your number in the last month, last quarter. So you're spending an awful lot of time now requalifying latent deals. You're building up your pipeline again. So even if you don't have deals closed at this point in the month, this point in the quarter, what have you spent this week doing? You know, you, you know, you may have had Monday off. Hopefully, you enjoyed a nice uh, Independence Day. Uh, but in the last two and a half days uh, of this week that we've had to start, what have you been doing to get yourself positioned to hit your number? I'm less worried about you know what you're doing day to day, week to week in terms of closing deals. I care about what you close by the end of the month. And so everything you're doing with every hour of the day, with every day of the month, day of the quarter, needs to be precise and disciplined and focus on helping you achieve that number at the end of the month, end of the quarter. Uh, so great question, Paul. Yeah, if we have any other questions, please join us on, on the phone, join us on Twitter. You know, we talked last week about, you know, we started to go down the list of some of the reasons why you might be behind your goals. We talked about not having a plan to begin with. We talked about not committing the resources to sell. We talked about not doing the daily disciplined work to actively manage your pipeline. I won't go into a lot of detail on that. If you want more detail for our discussion, definitely go to salespipelineradio.com. You can listen to the last week's episode uh, on demand in full. You know, the, the, the next on the list, <clears throat> you know, if you're managing a sales organization, sometimes you're letting your, your underperforming reps drag you down. Um, you know, you can't, you know, if you've got reps that have had a bad month, bad quarter, that happens to everybody. But it's important you've got the right people on the team that are focused, that are disciplined, that are closing deals. Um, those, those underperforming reps are definitely a coaching opportunity. I had one sales manager tell me once, I evaluate my sales team based on two criteria. Are they hitting their number and are they doing it the right way? If he's got people that are hitting their number and doing it the right way, what else do you need? How do I make you successful? How do I help you keep doing that? It's fantastic. If you're hitting your number, if you're not hitting your number, but you're doing it the right way, that's a coaching opportunity. If you've got people that are committed to the cause, if you've got people that are committed to your values, that are doing all the right things, that just, you know, we all have bad months and bad quarters sometimes, that's coaching and that's giving them all the resources they need to be successful. If people aren't hitting their number and aren't doing it the right way, then those are people you need to get out of the organization for sure, right? These are people that are, there's an opportunity cost to having that seat filled with someone that is not only not closing deals, but is talking to prospective customers and fumbling potential opportunities in a variety of ways. Now, here comes the kicker. If they're hitting their number, but not doing it the right way, the sales, the sales leader that I talked to says, you're fired. He said, you're doing it the right way, doing it in alignment with our values is more important than hitting your number because it is a slippery slope. And so when I talk about underperforming reps dragging you down, it's not just the reps that aren't hitting your number. It's the reps that are setting bad precedents for their peers. It's the reps that are not that are not stepping up and managing the business and treating their customers and their peers and their and you know not only across sales but across other departments the right way. So it's important that you have, you know, whatever makes sense for you and your organization, it's important to have sort of a discipline around finding the right reps that are doing it right and getting the number, you know, handing the number. Yeah, Paul. I'm listening to this, and my mouth just dropped right to the ground here. So you're telling me if somebody hits their numbers but does it the wrong way, you'd still let them go? Yep. Wow. Um, give me an example. Give, I'll give you an analogy in my business. I mean, we so you know we don't we don't have a, you know large sales team, you know, so I don't we don't. Have, I've, I've seen many clients that have done this, and it's a difficult decision. Uh, in some cases, it's a difficult conversation. Um, you know, when you've got a set of core values that you believe in, um, it can be easy to follow those values on a good day. <clears throat> when something goes wrong, when something happens that you don't like, sticking to those values is difficult. I can say we don't have sales, uh, you know, a huge sales team in our organization. But I will tell you that there's been a couple of cases where I've fired clients. And those clients have been clients that actually give me cash money. And their money is green just like the rest. And they, they have paid their bills on time. But, you know, at the end of the day, if I'm going to say we have a set of core values, if I'm going to say this is the way that we do business, if we don't stick with that, if we don't stick with that in the tough times, then how can I look my people in the eye and say that we actually have a set of core values? Boy, I think that is so brave and that is so real because so many of us set these lofty ideals, these lofty principles, but when times are tough, I'll take any money that walks in the door. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it is. I mean, you can call it brave. I'll, I'll, I call it terrifying. I mean, those you know, <laughs> those you know, those moments. I mean, again, it's I've, I've been in business now almost eight years doing Heinz marketing. I can count on two fingers the number of times we've had to to let a client go. Thankfully, we've been we've had pretty good success with most of them. But those are not fun days. Those are not fun days internally. It's not a fun conversation to have with the client, even when you know they're the wrong client. I mean, I think you know if you're gonna have if you're gonna have core values, you have to stick with them. You know, through thick and thin. So give me so, an example uh, of uh, you know, it doesn't have you can change the names or whatever, but. Yeah. Uh, not so much firing a client. I get that. Some clients are worth more than the money they give you uh, in terms of the problems they create and whatnot. It's just not uh, – it, or it takes you in the wrong direction. You're focusing on types of business you really shouldn't be doing here. But I'm really wondering again about this uh, uh, sales rep that doesn't f- do it the right way. I'm trying to picture what that is. Is it is it because he's unethical? Is it because he's um, creating? I don't know. He's too high pressured or something. Like that? What would it be that uh, you would look at this guy and say, like like the numbers you're hitting, but got to let you go, buddy. You're just doing it the wrong way. Yeah, I mean, there's so it's, it's a great question, and I've I've seen I've seen numerous numerous things, and again, I won't use, I won't name names of no. individuals and companies here. Um, I've seen companies, I've seen individuals that just apply a, an undue level of high pressure to prospects to close, um, to, to prospects that really aren't ready, that aren't going to be good customers, but gets it across the line so their numbers look better. I've seen reps promise things that they can't deliver on, whether it's some kind of a discount or whether it's a product that may be coming down the road that is not something that the organization is ready to commit to. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've seen reps that are demeaning to their peers, uh, that are insulting to their marketing colleagues. I've seen field sales reps that treat their inside sales counterparts as inferior. Quite frankly, they treat them as slaves. You know, I think, you know, when you're a field sales rep and you've got a counterpart in inside sales that is helping you qualify deals, that is an equal partnership when it's done well. And when you have someone that is not treating their peers right, um, that is cancerous to the entire organization. And if, and again, if you say that you have a set of core values and if you say we're going to do things right, if you allow someone that's doing the wrong thing, if you allow someone with bad behavior to stick around because they're hitting your number, you're telling the rest of the organization it is okay to be a jerk. It is okay to ignore the values if you're putting up dollars. And in some organizations, that may be the truth. And I, I completely understand that, you know, you still have to hit your number. Many companies are beholden to investors that are beholden to the market. Um, but I, I, I got it. You know, I have to, I have a lot of respect for people that say, listen, we can hit our number and do it right. And that reinforce those core values up and down the organization. Wow. Uh, well, well said. And I've certainly seen too many organizations in my own life that uh, say the right things. But when it comes push comes to shove, when they're backed into a corner, they'll do anything. Yeah. And I, and I can't reinforce enough, like how difficult that is to do in practice. Um, you know, I, you know, not only, uh, you know, the way we've done it, you know, in terms of managing client relationships, but also just watching sales organizations have that discussion. Um when you set precedents, when you set limits, when you set guidelines for how people are going to operate, um, even if it's not, you know, a, a, a fireable offense, uh, you know, you, you if you let some people slip, then you sort of you eliminate sort of the the way you can reinforce that behavior elsewhere. All right. So real quick before we run to break, I want to talk about the next on our list. So we talked a little bit about the underperforming reps. Also, it's really, really easy to focus on today's deals without managing and nurturing next month's deals and next quarter's deals. I would argue that the most important time for you to be building up your pipeline is when you are the busiest with your current pipeline. If you're only focused on today's deals and you're not building your next deals, then you're not going to have a pipeline next month and next quarter. You cannot rely, um, even if you have a marketing organization that generates leads, you at the end of the day are solely responsible for your number. You can't say, well, I didn't hit my number because marketing didn't generate leads for me. Well, why didn't you go generate leads for yourself, right? At the end of the day, you're responsible for your number. So managing and nurturing your long-term opportunities is, is, is concurrently important with closing today's deals. It's another reason why it is so important for you to be disciplined and focused in how you use your time, how you use every minute, every hour of every day, even at the beginning of the month, beginning of the quarter. All right, we got a lot more to talk about after we get back to the break. We got some more reasons why you're back behind on your number of things that will hopefully help you get back on track even this early in the month in the quarter. You're listening to Sales Pipeline Radio. 
Whether you're producing a seminar series, user's conference, lunch and learn, or exhibiting at a trade show, Validar has a solution. From capturing leads at trade shows to managing on-site registration, tracking session attendance, gathering information, and providing sponsors lead retrieval, we have a full suite of solutions for you. Since 2005, Validar has been turning corporate events and trade shows into better business. Call 888-784-2929 or visit us at Validar.com. And we want to remind you that uh, for those listening live or those listening later, that uh, there is a book that you can get to help you with all of this stuff. Uh, Because in a world where the speed of innovation and change in B2B marketing has never been greater, you really need something that will help you clarify all this. A blueprint, call it. A guide to what's really working and how you can apply it to specifically increase your sales pipeline growth the speed at which it travels through that pipeline, and ultimately conversion, sales. That's what you'll find in something called the Modern Marketer's Field Guide. And the most amazing thing is you can download it for free. That's right, F-R-E-E at HeinzMarketing.com, just like it sounds, H-E-I-N-Z, Marketing.com. This book encompasses the entire sales and marketing pipeline, but in quick bursts with lots of specific, actionable ideas, strategies, and tactics you can put to work today the entire table of contents helps you narrow in and tackle the problem and you're solving it right now before you even know it so if you want to come back and uh, you need something else to refer to over and over again keep it in your hip pocket it's your modern marketer's field guide available for free today right now at heinzmarketing.com all right we're back with uh, matt heinz giving us some uh, last show it was for those of you facing that final day of the quarter of the month, it seems like everybody takes a break and then they come back and they go, well, I got I got a whole month, I got a whole quarter. How do you get out of the gate and get going fast here? How do you not waste two or three days? I mean, it's hard, right? I mean, I think especially when you've got the weekend we just had. You know, yeah. you've, got a four, you've got a three-day Fourth of July weekend. You've got a Friday that's the first day of the month. So all of a sudden, you took four days off, and it's the fifth of the month. Yeah, that's, it's not it's not wrong to take that time off, right? I mean, you ha- I mean, all of us. There actually was a um, article I was reading yesterday that talked about it was actually a a psychological justification for taking vacation time, and it actually talked about just the impact of the on the brain of taking that time for yourself, both you know just not working in the evening as well as taking a long weekend versus taking a week or two to like just go sit on a beach. So as a sales rep, you have to do that as well. You you know that time not working is time not building a pipeline and time closing, but you still need that to be more effective during the time when you're actively selling. Here's somebody um, tweeted an interesting question. I don't know if it fits directly into what we're talking about, but how important is it to celebrate uh, a success? We're always turning the page and saying, great, I just made my goal. Now i got to start the next one. Now i got to start the next week. And, and you get into this psychological trap, I guess, if you're always feeling behind. How is important is it to, to take a moment and celebrate success? Oh, it's extremely important. I, I think it's not just important at the end of the month and the end of the quarter. Um, there's a lot of organizations that have gotten far better at celebrating the path to success. I mean, mm-hmm. with inside sales reps that are doing an appointment setting, um, they will sell, you know, a gong will go off every time someone sets an, a qualified appointment for one of the field sales reps and people will celebrate it. I've seen companies with brand new sales reps that when brand new sales reps get their first close, they have a gong, like a handheld gong, and they have to walk around the entire company, through <laughs> all the halls of all three floors of the company and like ring the gong and everyone stops and cheers for them as they go, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, mo- many companies have what they call something like President's Club, where at the end of the year, if you've hit your number or hit a, and exceeded a certain number, they will literally send you and a significant other, you know, to Mexico or to yeah, Hawaii. Right. And uh, so I think celebration is extremely important. You have to do it beyond just at the end of the month, end of the quarter. Um, again, like I said, sales is an emotional job. It is a difficult job. That it, it requires a ton of rejection. And so managing those emotions, managing your your mental state uh, throughout the selling period as well as just throughout the day, yeah, very, very important. My father was an executive with Chrysler Corporation. He was in charge of sales and marketing at one point in time for the entire company and used to teach sales. And he his favorite thing was, thank God for the no. When somebody says you know, he would say, thank you, sir, for getting that out of the way because I only have 212 more no's to go to before I get a yes. He had <laughs> figured out how many it took him to get there. So let's get him out of the way. Thank you for that no. Now I can move on. I don't know if that well, makes sense or not. but Oh, not only excuse me, not only is that important, but I think it's important to get the no as early as possible, right? I mean, a lot yeah. of sales reps are afraid to ask the hard question. 
a hard a, 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 ch- a chatty prospect is not a qualified prospect. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. You think you're doing good because you got him on the phone for 40 minutes or 40 hours or 40 weeks and you're having yeah. lots of meetings here, but all you're doing is wasting your time here. And well, and, 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 just, and they may be chatting. They may say, wow, this is great. I love this. Right. And they may be giving you all the positive feedback in the world. But if you were to ask the hard question, do you have budget for this? Well, no, I don't. Right. Or, hey, you know, I know you love this. Like, where does this fit into your priorities? Well, I love it. But I got 16 things in line before this gets done, right? And you know that prospect's never getting past priority five on their list because it always changes. So if you can't get your product or your service or your outcome that it represents into the top three or four of their priorities, that's a no, right? It's a, well, let's talk later. And so I think the sooner you can move on to another opportunity, the better off you're going to be to your to your point and to what your dad was saying. If you spend more time on that deal that is less likely to close, you as an opportunity cost of time, you could have been spending with deals that actually have a more high li- higher likelihood to close. You have to be focusing on deals that are qualified. So do you believe in the uh, the old theory of trial close, close early, close often, or is that uh, too pushy in today's environment here? I don't know that I believe in close early, close often. I believe in qualify early, qualify often. Mm. You know, I mean, I, th- I think if you find someone, I mean, I think of thinking about like my pipeline right now for our business, like I've got a, I've got a prospect that, you know, we've done, we've had a conversation for a long time. All of a sudden, um, they've got a, they've got something coming up in mid September that they need help for. And every day that goes by, we fall a little further, further behind and being able to actually impact that that event for them uh, in September. So there's some urgency for them to actually close. There's a need for them to close. I don't have to cl- focus on closing. I, c- I have to continue to focus on, you know, reinforcing the opportunity cost of not making a decision. Um, so if you, I think for, you know, if you've got someone qualified, if they have budget, if they have need, if they have authority, if there's urgency for them to make that decision, if there's something internally Something in their environment, it can be external as well, but something that's affecting them, that is forcing them to make a decision, and they've got all those other elements in place. That is a good qualified prospect. You don't. You, you, at a certain point, you want to try to get to the close, but I don't believe in closing early. I believe in qualifying. Mm, okay. Well, my father always said, you know, people are afraid as salespeople to get that no. And not only do you want to get them out of the way if it is a real no and get on to the next one, but he said if if you have a no, at least you have something to talk about. Why? You know, tell me why it's no. It's it, he said the ones that drove him crazy were the ones. Well, maybe I don't know. What do, where do you go with I don't know? Yeah. Well, and a, and a no is a no is sometimes isn't a door closed. Sometimes it's an objection. Right. right. Sometimes people say no. Well, why not? Well, I don't really understand what we're talking about. Or you know, I haven't I don't I haven't quantified what the value is for me. And then most people, if they hear a no, and if it's a real no, if it's a no, whether this isn't going to happen right now, it's not usually closed loss. It's closed later. Mm. Because the majority of opportunities don't necessarily go and choose someone else. I would I would t- say, look at your pipeline. Look at the deals that you lost over the course of the last six months. I'll bet you most of them, you lost it to nothing. They just <laughs> wow. didn't make a decision. They just didn't do anything. And it could be because their priorities changed. It be- could be because they lost their budget. All that stuff happens. It could be because it just wasn't the right time. And so if you if you take those completely out of mind, you may be missing on opportunities in your current quarter, in your current month, right? And so when they, someone says no, when someone says no, find out if it's a no, not right now. Find out what's going on in their environment. Find out what's what's got their attention right now. Find out when you can follow up. Find out what circumstances might change, what circumstances would need to change for them to all of a sudden find that a priority. And then you start looking for those buying signals. You start looking for those trigger events or those change moments, that might change the calculus inside the organization, that might change when they're ready to buy. So you don't throw away the no's. You don't uh, just put them in a big basket and go on to the next uh, batch here. You you might find some way to keep nurturing or keep in touch with them. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think in some in some cases, some organizations, that's part of marketing's job, is to then nurture those opportunities until they until you see that buying, the buying interest again. And I would argue even if they buy something from one of your competitors, you know, why not call in three months and say, how's that going? Hmm. Uh, I've done that a number of times, and sometimes they're like, well, you know what? Like, nothing really happened. Or, you know what? They were terrible, and we've already fired them. And I'm glad you called because, like, we need to do something else. And so you never know, right? I mean, and, and so if you got someone that far down the line, you got someone that qualified, making a phone call three months later to check in on them, 
I'll guarantee you that that is a more valuable phone call, a more likely to turn back into a pipeline phone call than a cold call to someone that you've never talked to that doesn't know who you are. Yeah, right. I'll give you an interesting quick story here. I used to own a bar many years ago. That was a crazy adventure with some people. And um, we had a rep that came in, and he said, I want all your what they call the back bar business, all the the stuff you pour every day, the, the bourbon, scotches, tequilas, and stuff. And we said no. And we went with somebody else. That rep came back every month or so, and he said, I'm back, and I am st- I know you picked them out. I hope it's working for you, but I'm still committed. I'm going to get that business from you. And it took him about a year. But within a year, we were so impressed with his energy and enthusiasm, and we weren't always thrilled with what we were getting. We ended up going with that, and I never forgot it. His persistence paid off. His persistence paid off, but he was also building a relationship along that yeah. time. And I bet you at a yeah. certain point, you, you know, we don't always buy from the best. Oftentimes, we buy from our favorite. Yeah, we, and we, we that's buy true. From people we like, we buy from people that we want to give the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, um, he was funny. He wasn't pushy. He just would come yeah. in and he'd be kind of funny and clever, and he'd he'd keep trying to support us and help us, even though we weren't giving him much or any business. And we just eventually, he just won us over. Yeah, no, it's and you, you see that all the time, and I think you know, it, it, you know, people historically have called this relationship selling. You know, my dad sold Caterpillar tractor equipment for thirty five years. You know, he's selling six figure tractors, six figure deals on tractors. It was not a, it was not a quick close, and there was a lot of competitors people could buy from. But my dad really focused on building a relationship. Yeah. He focused on understanding who those people were, what they cared about. He knew about their kids. He knew about their families. Uh, he took time to care about the executive, to the administrative assistant and the secretaries. Um, those take That takes extra time, right? Um, but the soft side of selling there uh, makes a big, big difference. And, and I don't know that I see that as much today. I think it's more about the quick sale, go after the low-hanging fruit. We have all these analogies of go get the quick ones, the easy ones. And we sometimes forget that it does if you take the time to develop a relationship, it's a continual flow of goods. Your dad kept getting sales from those same people he'd taken the time to develop a relationship with. Yeah, I think it's it's a it's a great point. I think it's one of the downsides of the current trend towards specialization in sales. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, one of our previous guests on the show, Aaron Ross, who wrote the book Predictable Revenue. I mean, the engine that he used to build Salesforce.com into the behemoth that it is that that worked then and works today is that you specialize roles where you've got someone who is following up on leads to qualify leads that gets passed on to a field sales rep that then takes the relationship forward. By definition, when you specialize, there is no one that is building the relationship and maintaining the relationship from the beginning. So you've got people that are coming in and playing a role. Um, and it works, right? But you lose the opportunity to build that relationship over time. And, you know, we still see many organizations that are investing that, that are not just saying, hey, we got to close a deal. They're saying, let's focus on long-term pipeline. It's very clear to me, Paul, that we need like a three hours. <laughs> I think so. We don't even get halfway through your list of stuff. I'm sorry. Yeah, I got this list of 10 things. I was pretty sure I was going to, I was going to have plenty of time left on the last show. And we're now only through five of 10. So yeah, we're going to, uh, we'll, uh, I think we're going to, we're going to talk to Jim. We're going to turn this into like a three hour drive. I think show. we have to. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And then we don't, and then we don't have even have a guess. Like, <laughs> Who needs guests? We'll just keep going through all these ex- no, past got, stories and experiences. So, <laughs> coming up here in the rest of July, we've got some amazing guests. Real quick before we have to wrap up, next week we've got Steve Richard, who is the founder of Voresight and the co-founder of ExecVision.io. He is doing some amazing things in terms of call coaching. So if you want help with your sales reps and coaching their calls, definitely check him out. Following week, we've got Joe Chernoff, who is the vice president of marketing at Insight Squared. Uh, Joe is basically the father, the founder of the HubSpot blog. If you are impressed with the volume and value you get from HubSpot's blog, that is Joe Chernoff's brain. Oh, they're amazing. amazing, I can't believe how much stuff they send out and how many times I go back and apply for free stuff from them and everything here. It's fantastic. So we're going to get some time with Joe. Great guest coming up at the end of the month and into August as well. Uh, If you like our conversations today, definitely check us out again at salespipelineradio.com. Download and subscribe to us on the iTunes Store and Google Play. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you here next week. Every week, Thursdays, 2.30 Eastern, 11.30 Pacific. We out of time. We'll see you next week on Sales Pipeline Radio. Well, once again, you've been at the only place that talks about how to build a sales pipeline and keep it growing and going with Matt Hines from Hines Marketing. 